The CEG was recorded while a patient was experiencing an absence seizure. The first characteristic finding that may come to your attention is the sudden change in activity that occurs about halfway through this reading. While the first half is normal, with a posterior dominant rhythm, the second half begins with an abrupt onset of epileptic discharges. After inspecting the EEG from top to bottom, we note that the discharges occur in every lead, or in other words, the epileptic activity is generalized. When following a lead from the start of the epileptic discharges to the end of the EEG, a repeating pattern becomes evident. With a closer look, we can see that each of the repeating complexes consists of a spike and a wave. Lastly, we need to determine the frequency of the complexes. Now, as you may be aware, the vertical bars are separated by a duration of one second. Counting the number of spike wave complexes that occur between the two bars, we find that approximately three occur per second. The frequency of these complexes, however, is variable and not necessarily consistent from start to finish. They often begin with a higher frequency and slow down a little before abruptly ending. To quickly summarize, the characteristic EEG findings in a patient experiencing an absence seizure include the sudden onset of generalized discharges consisting of spike and wave complexes occurring at a rate of approximately 3 per second. Erythema of the tympanic membrane is a common finding in patients with acute otitis media, however it is not by itself diagnostic of an infection. Patients with a cough or a fever may also be noted to have a reddened eardrum. Appreciation of the limitation of this finding is important in the prevention of inappropriate antibiotic prescription. This second example features a bulging tympanic membrane, which is the hallmark of acute otitis media. It is the single most specific sign of an infection of the middle ear. This third tympanic membrane is bulging, opaque, and covered by a thin layer of discharge. This combination of findings is highly predictive of acute otitis media. Opacity or cloudiness can also be seen in otitis media with effusion and cannot in isolation be used to distinguish between the two conditions. This fourth example features air boule, which is indicative of bullous meningitis, an ear infection that can be exquisitely painful. In addition to these findings, immobility detected by pneumatic otoscopy can provide evidence of a middle ear effusion. This can be particularly helpful when the tympanic membrane appears to be inflamed but is in a neutral position. The revised Jones criteria for acute rheumatic fever features five major and minor criteria. The five major criteria are arthritis, carditis, syndemchorea, subcutaneous nodules, and erythema marginatum. The five minor criteria are fever, arthralgia, elevated ESR, elevated CRP, and prolonged PR interval. In order to make the diagnosis, either two major or one major and two minor manifestations must be present. However, joint and cardiac manifestations can each be counted only once. That is, if the patient has arthritis as a major criterion, then arthralgia cannot be used as a minor criterion. Likewise, if carditis is counted as a major criterion, then PR prolongation cannot be used as a minor criterion. In addition to the clinical criteria, there must also be evidence of a prior group A streptococcal infection, which can be confirmed via either a positive throat culture, positive rapid strep test, or an elevated or rising anti-streptococcal antigen titer. Now, there are a few exceptions. A presumptive diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever can be made when chorea is the only manifestation, when indolent carditis is the only manifestation following an acute gas infection, and when recurrent acute rheumatic fever occurs in patients with a history of acute rheumatic fever associated carditis or rheumatic heart disease. The APGAR score is calculated by giving 0, 1, or 2 points per assessment in each of the five categories being evaluated. A stands for appearance and it refers to the level of oxygenation of the blood. Zero points are given if the baby is completely cyanotic or pale. One point is given for acrocyanosis, which is a cyanotic discoloration of the extremities. Two points are given if there is no cyanosis at all. P stands for pulse. The heart rate may be measured by oscillating the heart at the apex or by palpating the pulse at the umbilical cord. Zero points are given if a heartbeat is absent. One point is given if the heart rate is between 0 and 100 beats per minute. 
Two points are given if the heart rate is at least 100 beats per minute. G stands for grimace, and it refers to the level response to anoxious stimuli. The process of drying the baby may provide sufficient stimuli, or alternatively, a small catheter may be placed in the nares. Zero points are given if there is no response. One point is given if the response is minimal. Two points are given if the baby responds with a cry or active movement. The second day stands for activity, and it refers to muscle tone. Zero points are given if the baby is completely flaccid. One point is given if there is some muscle flexion. Two points are given if the baby is active. R stands for respiration, and it refers to the quality of breathing. Zero points are given if the baby is not breathing. One point is given if the baby has a weak cry or is breathing slowly and irregularly. Two points are given if the baby has a strong cry or has a normal rate and effort of breathing. After having assessed each parameter, add together the total number of points given. A total score between 7 and 10 points is considered normal. Few babies receive a score of 10 because of the high prevalence of peripheral cyanosis due to a condition called transient tachypnea of the newborn. These babies require only routine post-delivery care. A score between 4 and 6 is considered to be moderately abnormal. These babies need some resuscitative efforts, such as nasal suctioning and oxygenation. A score of 3 or less is considered to be low. These babies need full resuscitation. The score is used to assess the status of the newborn and the successfulness of resuscitation. The comparison of sequel examinations will help determine if the baby's condition has remained the same, improved, or deteriorated. Benign neonatal sleep myoclonus only occurs during sleep. The eyes are closed while the movements are occurring, and the movements cease upon awakening. No leptiform activity is detected on electroencephalography, and the condition does not respond to antiepileptic medication. Myoclonic seizures can occur during sleep or while the patient is awake. The eyes may be opened or closed during a seizure, and awakening the patient does not stop the myoclonus. Interictal epileptiform activity may be present on electroencephalography, and myoclonic seizures are moderately responsive to antiepileptic drugs. When assessing a baby or child in a secondary care setting, admit them to the hospital if they have any of the following. Apnea, either observed or reported. Persistent oxygen saturation, when breathing air, of less than 90% for children aged 6 weeks and over, or less than 92% for babies under 6 weeks, or children of any age with underlying health conditions. Now please be aware that your local guidelines may differ regarding oxygen saturation. They may also take into consideration the phase of the illness. Inadequate oral fluid intake, that is, about 50-75% to of usual volume, taking account of risk factors and using clinical judgment, or persisting severe respiratory distress, for example, grunting, marked chest recession, or respiratory rate of over 70 breaths per minute. To mention once more, your local guidelines may have other absolute criteria for admission that are not stated here. Also consider admission to the hospital if any of the following are present. Risk factors for more severe bronchiolitis, such as chronic lung disease, hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease, age in young infants, such as under 3 months, premature birth, particularly under 32 weeks, neuromuscular disorders, and immunodeficiency. Also consider factors that might affect a carer's ability to look after a child with bronchiolitis, such as social circumstances, the skill and confidence of the carer in looking after a child with bronchiolitis at home, confidence in being able to spot red flag symptoms, and distance to healthcare in case of deterioration. Cyanotic breath-holding spells are usually triggered by emotional or physical upset, while with tonic-clonic seizures a precipitating factor is not usually identified. The eyes are closed during a breath-holding spell, but are open during a tonic-clonic seizure. Post-ictal symptoms do not occur following a breath-holding spell, 
Whereas following a tonic seizure, the patient often experiences fatigue, confusion, and other symptoms. Breath-holding spells do not occur during sleep, whereas tonic seizures commonly do. Children with breath-holding spells often have a family history of the condition, whereas those with seizures may have a family history of epilepsy. The interact electroencephalograph is normal in patients with breath-holding spells, but often abnormal in those with tonic seizures. The manifestations of congenital rubella syndrome can be categorized as early or late onset. The characteristic triad of congenital rubella syndrome includes hearing impairment, cardiac defects such as pain in ductus arteriosus and peripheral pulmonary stenosis, and ocular defects such as retinopathy and congenital cataracts. Visual and auditory defects are also seen in congenital cytomegalovirus infection however heart defects are not, which can help differentiate it from congenital rubella syndrome. A few other early onset manifestations of congenital rubella syndrome include hematologic disorders such as hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and extramedular hematopoiesis. Then there are also hepatic disorders such as hepatitis and growth disturbances such as microcephaly and fetal growth restriction. Now, a few late onset manifestations include further hearing loss, intellectual disability, diabetes mellitus, thyroid dysfunction, and progressive panencephalitis. Charge syndrome can affect many areas of the body and the clinical features that occur varies greatly between affected children. C stands for coloboma, in which normal tissue and structures that form the eye are absent at birth, resulting in a gap. C could also stand for cranial nerve defects, which are also common in CHARGE syndrome. H stands for heart defects, such as Tetralogy of Fellow. A stands for atresia cone, in which one or both nasal passages are completely blocked. In less severe forms, the nasal passage may only be narrowed, which is referred to as coenal stenosis. R stands for retardation of growth and development. G stands for genital and urinary abnormalities, such as duplex kidneys, renal agenesis or hypoplasia, hypogonadism, cryptorchidism, and hypospadias. E stands for ear abnormalities, of which a variety can occur, and deafness, which is usually sensory neural. Several other less common features, such as tracheosophageal atresia, may also occur in addition to the aforementioned clinical features. The following list of dysmorphic features associated with Down syndrome is not all-inclusive, but consists of many of the more recognized facial and extremity manifestations of trisomy 21. Individuals with Down syndrome often have upward slanting palpebral fissures with epicanthal folds and wide spaced eyes, a flat nasal bridge, and an open mouth with a protruding tongue. Other characteristic findings include brush filled spots in the eyes as well as low set ears. However, not all of these features may be present. Another very characteristic finding is the presence of a single transverse palmar crease. This is not a pathognomonic finding, however, as it can occur in other conditions and in asymptomatic individuals as well. Those with trisomy 21 may also show joint hyperflexibility and a wide space between the first and second toes, amongst other findings. These are some of the more common external dysmorphic features in patients with Down syndrome. It is important to keep in mind that many other internal malformations and comorbidities may also be present. Erythema toxicum neonatorum usually appears between 24 to 72 hours of life. It presents with small papules that quickly become pustules, and has papules which are surrounded by an erythematous halo. The lesions do not appear on the palms and soles, and the lesions do not result in hyperpigmentation. Transient neonatal pustular melanosis is usually present at birth. It presents with vesicles, pustules, and macules which are not surrounded by an erythematous halo. The lesions can occur almost anywhere on the body, including the palms and soles, 
and the following rupture may leave behind a hyperpigmented macule with a color at scale. Growing pains typically occur in the evening or during the night, often awakening the child from sleep. Pain that persists into the morning or occurs during the day is unlikely to be due to groin pains. The episodes are paroxysmal. Pain that is persistent or increases in intensity should be investigated. Although episodes may occur a couple nights in a row, it is much more common for symptom-free periods to last days or months. The discomfort caused by growing pains is bilateral and symmetrical. Pain may occur in the upper extremity, but only in conjunction with lower limb involvement. The pain is typically poorly localized. If it is isolated to or specifically affects the joints, then further evaluation is necessary. Growing pains do not affect the functional ability of the child. Their participation in sports and physical activities should be unaltered. With the exception of joint hypermobility, the physical examination should be completely normal. There should not be any evidence of systemic opposite or specific pathology. As well, if investigative studies are performed, the results should be normal. Patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy often have a family history of the disease since it is a genetic condition with an autosomal dominant inheritance. A myriad of ECG abnormalities may be present, such as left axis deviation, pathologic Q waves, and inverted T waves. On echocardiography, the hypertrophy is usually asymmetric and greater than 13 mm in women and 15 mm in men. As well, there is a diastolic filling abnormality with a left ventricular and diastolic dimension of less than 45 mm. Following deconditioning, regression in left ventricular hypertrophy does not occur. Patients with athletic heart syndrome do not generally have a family history of the condition since it is benign and dependent on one's level of physical activity. ECG findings such as bradycardia and AV block can occur but disappear with activity. On echocardiography, the hypertrophy is symmetric and is less pronounced than in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. As well, diastolic filling is normal. And finally, following deconditioning, there is greater than 2 mm of left ventricular regression. IJ nephropathy begins days after the onset of an inciting illness. Whereas post-treptic glomerulonephritis has a latent period that lasts several weeks. The inciting illness for IJ nephropathy may also be a urinary tract infection or gastroenteritis. Whereas for post-treptic glomerulonephritis it may be a skin infection. C3 levels are usually normal for IJ nephropathy, while they are usually significantly reduced for post-treptogalco glomerulonephritis. Biopsy studies may detect mesangial IJ deposits in cases of IJ nephropathy. In post-treptogalco glomerulonephritis, a streptozyme test is used to confirm a recent group A streptococcal infection. In IJ nephropathy, hypertension is initially treated with an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker while furosemide is used first in patients with post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. The most common type is non-bullous in patigo. It begins with macules and papules, which fill with fluid to become vesicles. These vesicles quickly burst and may go unnoticed. The resulting lesion is a superficial erosion with a honey-colored crust. The second type is bullous in patigo, in which the initial lesions grow into much larger bullae. Rupture of these flaccid boulae also results in superficial erosions with the characteristic honey-colored crust. In the last subtype, ecthyma, the lesions also progress from macules and papules to vesicles and boulae, but they extend deep into the dermis, resulting in ulcers with raised violaceous borders. These lesions may result in scarring. According to the Wessel criteria, also known as the rule of threes, Infantile colic is defined as unexplained crying or fussiness in an otherwise healthy and well-nourished infant that lasts greater than 3 hours per day, occurs more than 3 days per week, and is persisted for longer than 3 weeks. However, a presumptive diagnosis is usually made even if it has not been ongoing for at least 3 weeks, and it is generally confirmed retrospectively after the condition has resolved. Hoarseness and a seal-like barking cough are associated with infectious group, whereas acute epicotitis may present with a muffled voice, drooling, and dysphagia. Radiological signs for infectious group include the steeple sign, due to superior tapering of the trachea, and subglottic narrowing. For acute epicotitis, a lateral radiograph may reveal a swollen epiglottis, 
a radiologic finding known as the thumbprint sign. A single dose of corticosteroids are given once infectious group is diagnosed, while intravenous antibiotics are given for acute epiglottitis once blood samples are taken. Nebulized epinephrine is added to the treatment regimen for moderate to severe croup, while it is not recommended for acute epiglottitis of any severity. Individuals exposed to a patient with infectious croup are not administered prophylactic medication, while those with a significant exposure to a patient with acute epiglottitis will receive rifampin. Irritant contact dermatitis presents with confluent areas of shiny erythema. The skin folds are usually spared, a potassium hydroxide stain, if ordered, will be negative. It is managed with skin care, such as frequent diaper changes, barrier preparations, and potentially low potency topical steroids, and will usually resolve within a few days. Candida dermatitis presents with beefy red flakes, a scaly rash, and satellite lesions. Unlike with irritant contact dermatitis, the inguinal folds are usually involved. A potassium hydroxide stain, if ordered, may demonstrate pseudohyphae. It is treated similarly as irritant contact dermatitis with the addition of topical antifungals, and it usually resolves within two weeks with appropriate treatment. Fever is considered an obligatory manifestation of Kawasaki disease. There should be no other explanation for the fever, and while there is some leniency in regards to the duration, it is expected to have been present for at least 5 days. While there is a large variety of manifestations that are caused by Kawasaki disease, only 5 signs of mucocutaneous inflammation are included in the criteria. Within the first few days of illness, children may develop non-supportive anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. There can be redness of the overlying skin, but pain and tenderness do not usually occur. At least one lymph node greater than 1.5 cm in diameter is required for the diagnosis, and in actuality, only a single lymph node is usually enlarged. Diffuse lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly are uncommon and should put the diagnosis into question. A rash may begin on the trunk and then spread to the rest of the body. If an antibiotic was administered, then it may be erroneously attributed to an allergic reaction. The rash is usually maculopapular and erythematous, but a variety of types may occur, such as erythema multiforme or a morbilliform or scarletiform rash. Vesicles and bullae, however, do not usually occur. The conjunctival injection associated with Kawasaki disease typically begins within days of onset. It is usually bilateral, bulbar with sparing of the limbus, and unexcutative. Although painless, there may be photophobia, and uveitis, when present, should increase suspicion of Kawasaki disease. Mucositis develops as Kawasaki disease progresses. There may be marked erythema of the lips, pharynx, and tongue. The lips may become swollen with cracking and bleeding and the erythema of the tongue in combination with swollen pap-like can give an appearance often described as a strawberry tongue. About one week into the illness, the hands and feet may become diffusely swollen with erythema of the palms and soles. This culmination of the skin occurs about a week or two later. If the fever criteria and four or five of the clinical criteria are met, then the diagnosis is established. Now, if a clinician has a great deal of experience in treating Kawasaki disease, then the diagnosis can be established prior to the fourth day of illness. Kawasaki disease should be considered in any child that has a fever of 5 days duration without any other explanation. If in addition to the fever criteria, 4 or 5 of the clinical criteria are met, then the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease is established. However, when only 2 or 3 of the clinical criteria are met, then a case of incomplete Kawasaki disease should be considered. The first step in this situation would be to evaluate the C-reactive protein level and the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Elevation of either supports the diagnosis and should be followed with an assessment of the supplementary laboratory criteria. If less than three of these criteria are met, then echocardiography should be performed before initiating definitive therapy. However, if three or more criteria are met, then the definitive therapy can be initiated prior to echocardiography. Now, if neither the CRP or SED rate are elevated, but the fever persists after two days, then the child should be reevaluated. And echocardiography should also be ordered for children with normal CRP and SED rates if typical peeling occurs in the fingers and toes following defervescence. Both Kawasaki disease and scarlet fever cause elevations in body temperature, adenopathy, strawberry tongue, 
rash, and disquamation. However, the fever in Kawasaki disease is minimally responsive to NSAIDs and acetaminophen, while the elevated blood temperature caused by scarlet fever responds to regular antipyretics. The adenopathy in Kawasaki disease is usually painless, while it is tender in scarlet fever. A variety of different rashes can occur with Kawasaki disease, but the rash of scarlet fever has more consistent findings such as blanching on pressure, fine papillae, and pastia lines. Part of the evaluation for Kawasaki disease is serial echocardiography. In scarlet fever, evidence of streptococcal infection is verified with a rapid antigen test or culture. Treatment for Kawasaki disease includes high-dose aspirin and intravenous immunoglobulins, while scarlet fever is treated with antibiotics that target streptococcus pyogenes. Kawasaki disease can cause aneurysm formation in a variety of locations and depress cardiac contractility. Scarlet fever is associated with immune complications that include rheumatic fever and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Like calvary parthes disease usually occurs between the ages of 4 and 8, while slipped capital femoral hypophysis usually occurs between the ages of 10 and 15. Children with leg calvary parthes disease tend to be shorter in stature, while those with slipped capital femoral hypophysis are typically overweight. X-ray findings for leg calvary parthes disease are variable, but with advanced disease the femoral head is severely deformed. With slipped capital femoral hypophysis there is displacement of the femoral neck. Patients with leg calvary parthes disease are usually treated conservatively with bed rest and analgesia, while urgent surgery is indicated for most patients with slipped capital femoral epiphysis. When patients with leg calvary parthes disease require surgery, surgical containment often involves femoral osteotomies. In patients with slipped capital femoral epiphysis, surgery usually involves internal fixation with a single cannulated screw. The radiographic findings that provide evidence of leg calvary parthes disease evolve through four stages. Early on in the disease, pathologic changes may not be appreciable on a plain radiograph, but as the disease progresses, characteristic signs become apparent. A complete discussion of these changes is beyond the scope of the boards, so instead we will simply become accustomed to x-rays with vividly clear abnormalities. In the radiograph on the left, significant bone resorption has led to collapse and deformation of the femoral head. Compare with the normal radiograph on the right. In this radiograph, both hip joints are affected, the left hip joint more than the right. Neuroblastoma is associated with Opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome, whereas Wilms tumor is associated with Weiger syndrome and Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Neuroblastoma may cross the midline, whereas Wilms tumor usually does not. Neuroblastoma are usually fixed and immobile, whereas Wilms tumor may be displaced. Constitutional symptoms are common with neuroblastoma, whereas they are rather uncommon with Wilms tumor. Vanilla medullic acid and homovanillic acid levels are usually elevated in neuroblastoma, whereas in Wilms tumor these catecholamine metabolite levels are not elevated. For the diagnosis of type 1 neural fibromatosis, Two or more of the following clinical features must be present. Six or more caffeoli macules in prepubertal children, each macule must be greater than 5 mm in greatest diameter, while in postpubertal children, 15 mm is the cutoff. Two or more neurofibromas of any type, or one plexiform neurofibroma. Two or more Lisch nodules, which are iris hematomas, freckling in the axillary or inguinal regions an optic glioma, a distinctive bony lesion such as sphenoid dysplasia, and a first-degree relative, be it a parent, sibling, or offspring, with neurofibromatosis type 1 based on the above criteria. The first type we will discuss is distal renal tubular acidosis. In type 1 RTA, the serum potassium level is low to normal. The urine pH is typically 5.5 or greater. Nephrolithiasis is a potential complication. And the urine calcium creatinine ratio is typically high. The second type is proximal renal tubular acidosis. In type 2 RTA, the serum potassium level is also low to normal. The urine pH is typically less than 5.5. 
nephrolithiasis does not usually occur, and the urine calcium to creatinine ratio is usually normal. And lastly, we will discuss type 4 renal tubular acidosis. In this type of RTA, the serum potassium level is typically high. The urine pH is lower than 5.5. As in type 2 RTA, nephrolithiasis is not a common complication, and the urine calcium to creatinine ratio is normal. So when it comes to differentiating between these three types of renal tubular acidosis, a high urine pH, that is a pH higher than 5.5, would suggest type 1 RTA, as with nephrolithiasis and a high urine calcium to creatinine ratio. On the other hand, a high serum potassium would suggest type 4 RTA. But if neither the serum potassium is elevated, nor the urine pH, then we may be dealing with a type 2 RTA. With malarinogenesis, also known as vaginalogenesis, the person's karyotype is 46XX. They develop a normal lower vagina and ovaries, but may only have a rudimentary uterus and upper vagina. Hormonal levels are unaffected, and as such breast development occurs during puberty, as does adrenarche. With androgen insensitivity syndrome, the person's karyotype is 46XY. They develop a normal lower vagina, but not an upper vagina or uterus. As well, there's cryptorchidism. Thalarchy occurs at puberty, but without hair growth in the axilla or pubic region. With complete XY gonadotogenesis, the person's karyotype is, well, 46XY. They develop a uterus and external female genitalia, but with streak gonads. Thalarchy does not occur, but pubic hair does develop during puberty. With 5-alpha reductase deficiency, the person's karyotype is also 46XY. They develop male internal urogenital organs without a uterus or ovaries, and external genitalia at birth may be either female or ambiguous. Thalarchy does not occur, but adrenarche does. There are two inclusion criteria for febrile seizures. A body temperature elevated above 38 degrees Celsius and age between 3 months and 6 years. There are also four exclusion criteria. History of a previous afebrile seizure. A seizure that occurs in a febrile child is not considered a febrile seizure if that child has previously suffered an unprovoked seizure or has a specific epilepsy syndrome. Central nervous system infection or pathology. It is vital to rule out any disease of the central nervous system before concluding that the child had a febrile seizure. Acute system metabolic abnormality that may cause a seizure. A variety of acute metabolic derangements can cause a seizure, such as an abnormal serum sodium or glucose concentration. The last exclusion criteria is developmental delay, which comes with a caveat. Neural development is expected to be normal in a child with a simple febrile seizure. However, children who experience a complex febrile seizure may have developmental delay. Simple febrile seizures are generalized in onset, last shorter than 15 minutes in duration, and occur only once in a 24-hour period. The child will have been developing normally, and the neurological examination should be completely normal. As well, a family history of febrile seizures is common. Complex febrile seizures may be focal in onset, last longer than 15 minutes, and recur within a 24-hour period. The child may be developmentally delayed, and focal features or postictal deficits may be present on the neurologic examination. Finally, there often isn't a family history of febrile seizures.
Slipped capital femoral apophysis is actually a misnomer. As seen in this image, the femoral apophysis is located in the normal position within the acetabulum. The pathology, in fact, usually involves slippage of the femoral head at the metaphysis. Focusing on the proximal femur distal to the growth plate, we could see that the femoral neck is displaced superiorly. This in turn makes the epiphysis look like it has slipped inferiorly. The slippage in this case is not that obvious for the untrained eye. Compare it with the plain radiograph of a normal hip on the right. To help detect the abnormality, a line referred to as Klein's line is drawn along the superior edge of the femoral neck. If the hip is without pathology, the line will pass through a portion of the femoral head. A line that does not intersect the femoral head or a line that only passes along the superior edge is indicative of slipped capital femoral epiphysis. This finding is referred to as Chertoen sign. In more advanced cases, the abnormality is easier to detect and is often likened to a scoop of ice cream falling off an ice cream cone. And really, it does kind of look like that. I recommend that you search the web for some x-rays so that you can see it for yourself. In addition to fever and sore throat, Streptococcal pharyngitis may present with headache, nausea, vomiting, and or abdominal pain. Symptoms suggestive of viral pharyngitis include cough, corza, conjunctivitis, and diarrhea. Tonsillar exudates are commonly present in streptococcal pharyngitis, while they are usually absent in cases of viral etiology. Tender anterior cervical adenopathy is a sign of streptococcal pharyngitis, while lymphadenopathy is usually painless in viral pharyngitis. Streptococcal pharyngitis must be confirmed with either a rapid antigen detection test or culture, while ancillary testing is generally not indicated when the etiology is viral. Strep throat is treated with antibiotics, while only supportive therapy is needed for viral pharyngitis. Bacterial association is an acronym used to describe a group of anomalies that tend to co-occur. It affects multiple parts of the body and thus is associated with a wide variety of manifestations. V stands for vertebral anomalies, such as fused or misshapen vertebrae. A stands for anal atresia, which may be accompanied by lower genital urinary abnormalities. C stands for cardiovascular abnormalities the most common of which are ventricular and atrial septal defects. Tetralogy of phyllo may also occur. T stands for tracheosophageal fistula, while E stands for esophageal atresia. R stands for renal anomalies, such as renal dysplasia or aplasia and vesiculo-ureteral reflux. And L stands for limb anomalies, such as radial aplasia. Individuals with Vactor Association typically have three or more of the aforementioned features. Facial asymmetry and vancomianemia are just two other features that may occur, but are not represented by the acronym. <laughs>